Welcome back to the channel. Today we'll be discussing two of the most essential drug classes in the healthcare field, ACE inhibitors and ARBs. We will look into their mechanism, common users, side effects, and some monitoring parameters. Let us begin right away. Please hit the like button so the YouTube algorithm can kick in and somebody who's also looking for a good review on ACE inhibitors and ARBs can also find this video. So angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin II receptor blockers are mainly used to reduce blood pressure. They have specific indications, but for now, let's just focus on the fact that they reduce blood pressure. To appreciate how they reduce blood pressure, we need to understand the mechanism of the RAS system, also known as the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It starts with the juxtaglomerular cells in the kidneys. They hang out around the afferent arterioles. These are just vessels that bring blood into the glomerulus of the kidney for it to be filtered. Now, once the juxtaglomerular cells detect reduced renal perfusion, the RAS system gets activated. And this system begins when the juxtaglomerular cells release renin. Angiotensinogen in the liver gets cleaved by renin to form angiotensin 1. Then finally, ACE, the enzyme, help convert the angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. It would then bind to angiotensin 2 type 1 and type 2 receptors. ACE inhibitors inhibit the ACE enzyme, while ARBs prevent the blocking of angiotensin 2 to the type 1 angiotensin 2 receptors. As we will see next, the type 1 receptors are the main ones for the immediate and chronic effects of angiotensin 2. Now what exactly are these immediate and chronic effects? So whenever the body senses reduced blood flow to any organ, it will always try to correct this by increasing the blood pressure. So angiotensin 2 tries to actually fix the problem of reduced blood flow to the kidneys by causing vasoconstriction, which will ultimately increase the systemic blood pressure. Next, it stimulates the adrenal cortex. Now this is a triangular shaped gland that's located right on top of your kidneys. This leads to the production of aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. Aldosterone works by reabsorbing sodium in the kidneys back into the blood. And this will increase the blood volume again, which would then increase the blood pressure. And as we all know, wherever sodium goes, water follows. So that's when antidiuretic hormone comes into play. These functions of angiotensin II provides a quick immediate fix for the reduced blood flow to the kidneys. But angiotensin II takes things way too personal. So even though it fixed the problem right away, it also has chronic effects that take some time to fully kick in and meant to fix the problem long term. So in the vessels, angiotensin II leads to induction of growth, cell migration, mitosis, collagen synthesis, leading to thickening of the vascular wall. The heart has to pump through all of this resistance and tension, so over time, it also leads to cardiac remodeling, which is when the heart changes in size, mass, geometry, and function. So here is a synopsis of what angiotensin II normally does to increase blood pressure. And then here are the effects of angiotensin II after it is inhibited by ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So as you can see, even in normal circumstances, angiotensin II ain't that benign. And that is why it's imperative to block the activity of angiotensin II because when we block it, we get the opposite effects. And overall, improving the blood flow and also reversing changes in the heart and the vessel walls. And this is the reason why we use it for the following conditions. Hypertension. So when you have high blood pressure, there's resistance in the blood flow which causes reduced blood to the kidneys. This will lead to activation of the RAS system which will worsen the hypertension. So ACE inhibitors and ARBs are perfect for this. Heart failure. This is a disease where your heart is not pumping blood efficiently. This will lead to decreased blood flow to the kidneys and then the RAS system will become activated. Angiotensin II will then come and make everything worse. So once again, ACE inhibitors and ARBs will save the day. We also also use these agents for heart attacks where your heart may not be functioning as well due to damage leading to reduced amount of blood that pumps out and subsequently reduced renal blood flow lastly in patients with diabetes kidney disease ACE inhibitors and ARBs are used to slow the progression of it by decreasing proteinuria. So in patients with diabetes and or CKD, proteinuria occurs due to a combination of many things associated with the disease. One of them being an increase in pressure
pressure in the glomerulus of the kidney. So the glomerulus is simply a network of small blood vessels that filters things out of the blood. Blood will normally flow in from the afferent arterioles, then things will get filtered out the blood, and then it will exit through the efferents. So to remember, just know that E is for exit, so efferents, and A is for approach, so afferents. Whenever there's a decrease in blood flow to the kidneys, like we see in diabetes, the RAS system gets activated and the release of angiotensin II causes constriction of the efferent arterial, so less blood is leaving out because it's panicking that the kidney isn't getting blood. When this happens, things get backed up and the pressure within the blood vessels in the glomerulus increases and it's like it's pushing against the vessel wall trying to come out and this will promote filtration of proteins into the urine. When we give ACE inhibitors and ARBs, they inhibit angiotensin II, which will lead to vasodilation of the efferent arterial. And this will allow the blood to flow out and reduce the pressure within the glomerulus and also reverse the proteinuria. And that is why these medications are so essential in the healthcare system. Some of the common ACE inhibitors we see in our daily practice are lisinopril, enalapril, benazepril, captopril, and many more. But the generic names of these agents all end in pril. Some of the common ARBs are Losartan, Valsartan, Candysartan, and Omisartan. And the generic name of these agents all end in Sartan. Now, even though these agents may seem like miracle drugs, they are just like any other medication. They have side effects. Some of the ones they share are dizziness or syncope, which can all be due to abnormally low blood pressure, an increase in the serum creatinine or BUN, which I'll discuss the mechanism next. These agents can also cause hyperkalemia because normally angiotensin II leads to release of aldosterone, which retains sodium and excrete potassium. So the inhibition of the angiotensin II will result in hyperkalemia. Now, ACE inhibitors are the main ones known to cause dry hack and cough, a side effect that can impact the patient's adherence. They can also cause angioedema. ARBs have a much lower risk of causing these, and so we will discuss the mechanism to get a better understanding why. Increase in the serum creatinine or BUN is a side effect we expect to see usually within the first two weeks of treatment. It occurs due to the dilation of the efferent vessel, the one that the blood exits from. So this causes more blood to flow out decreasing the filtration of the blood in the glomerulus. Therefore, the creatinine and BUN in your blood that normally gets filtered out doesn't and leads to increased levels of the serum creatinine and BUN. To manage this, since we expect it, we would just continue treatment and monitor the patient closely. For serum creatinine above 30% from baseline, we would discontinue these agents. And no need to switch to ARBs in this case because you would get the same effects. Angioedema is a rare but very serious complication of ACE inhibitors and ARBs. It is characterized by swelling of the face, lips, and the upper airway, making it difficult to breathe. It occurs due to the inhibition of the breakdown of bradykinin, a molecule that causes vasodilation, extravasation, and inflammation. Extravasation is simply when fluid leads from the vessels into the tissues. When you inhibit the ACE enzyme, it will lead to accumulation of bradykinin, which will then promote fluid to leak into the tissues and cause the swelling. When angioedema occurs, we must discontinue the agent immediately and begin management for angioedema. ARBs can still cause angioedema, but it's a much lower risk because ARBs do not inhibit the ACE enzyme. There's also a risk of a cross-reactivity after angioedema on an ACE inhibitor, but this is low. In this case, the risk and benefits must be weighed. If you decide to put the patient on an ARB after, you must monitor closely for angioedema. Unlike angioedema, which is rare, as a pharmacist, you're very likely to have a patient with a dry hack and cough when they're on these agents, which usually presents within 1 to 24 weeks of initiation, and it occurs because the accumulation of the brady kinin leads to bronchial irritation. If this is unbearable for the patient, we must discontinue the ACE inhibitor, and usually this will get rid of the cough within 1 to 4 days. We can also start the patient on an ARB if the patient needs the blood pressure control. Patients on ARBs can still experience this cough, but it's just a lower incidence. Fun facts. The use
use of OTC or prescription cough medicine will not work as it doesn't treat the underlying issue. Your patients will ask you about this, so please don't forget this, plus other fun facts that I would love to share with you next. In terms of which to use first, most guidelines will say ACE inhibitors first and then ARBs as an alternative. But if you do some research, you will find out that there are studies out there that also support that you could use ARBs first. Another thing is that the trials for the ACE inhibitors were published about a decade before the ARBs. So it's possible that clinicians are more familiar with it. And that is why you tend to see more patients on the ACE inhibitors. So it's not wrong to start a patient off with ARBs first because you're concerned of side effects and the ARBs are more tolerable. Now, if the patient is already on the ACE inhibitor, then leave it and save the ARB for when the patient cannot tolerate the ACE inhibitor. Studies have shown that the clinical benefits of ACE inhibitors and ARBs in heart failure patients appear to be dose dependent and a better benefit has occurred at higher target doses. So you always want to try to titrate the patient's medication to reach those doses. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are not recommended during pregnancy due to reduced perfusion to parts of the fetus and it should be completely avoided. Studies have shown that African-American patients with hypertension respond less to ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and they believe it's because these patients' hypertension may not be due to high levels of renin. Therefore, these agents do not work well. Lastly, because ACE inhibitors and ARBs can work at the kidney and reduce the filtration, they can interact with a lot of drugs that are excreted by the kidneys. Some notable ones are NSAIDs and diuretics. And that will be the end of this video. I'm sorry if the video is a little bit long, but I hope it gave you a comprehensive review of these agents. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment, and follow me on my Instagram at Pharmacist Academy. Thank you for watching this video and take care.